Okay, so again, Happy New Year, folks. Uh, we're starting a new series, which will be taking us through the month of January or thereabouts. And I want to start off by explaining my intention, my desire, my heart for this series. The foundational principle I'm building this on is that intimacy with God is better than busyness for God. Okay, Intimacy with God is more important than busyness for God for God. Okay, that's my heart. And that's why I'm calling this series, Oh, for a closer walk with God. Because it's not about doing more this year. My heart for this year as a church is to get more out of our relationship and our walk with God. And so in the very first morning of a new year, I'm sure many of you will have talked about New Year's resolutions or whether you're doing them, whether you're not doing them. But I wonder, spiritually speaking, how many of you are content right now with where you are spiritually, with where the church is spiritually? I'm not. I'm not. There is more and pastorally speaking my heart aches because i know there is more of god to experience and savor both individually for me and for you and collectively as a church to savor and to enjoy and to thrill our hearts and so what i'm calling for at the start of a new year is not resolutions but revelation the question we have to start with though is are you with me? Do you want it? See, so many of us, okay, and especially the men, okay, we are action-oriented people. We think about our faith in terms of what we do for God. Well, someone will say, well, are you a good Christian? We say, well, yes, of course I am. I do this. I help a campaigners. I, 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 I do some caretaking. I, I, I work this team. I'm part of this. I do this. Of course I'm a good Christian. Look at the things I do. Look how busy I am. But our faith does not call us to live by a code of conduct. That Christianity is simply do A, B and C, avoid X, Y and Z and that is Christianity. No, Bible calls us to relationship. And that's hard, right? Especially for us men, to talk about relationships, right? We find that harder to do. So, so often it would be so much easier for us to say, look, just, just tell me what you want me to do and I'll go do it, right? We experience that with our wives sometimes. It's like, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, whatever. Just tell me what you need me to do. What is the thing that you need done right now? I don't want to talk about my feelings. I don't want to talk about our emotions. I just want my instructions. Let me go forth and do. And I will do it gladly for you. But just tell me what you need me to do. Right? But... See in our marriages, that attitude doesn't cultivate a, 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 a closeness. Sure it doesn't. It doesn't create intimacy because relationship is more than what we do. It is about being together as we do. Right? Marriage is doing life together. Emphasis on together. Now let's apply that to our faith. And see how many Christians you see drifting into working for Jesus instead of living with Jesus as part of their life and doing it with them together. They don't have that togetherness. The Bible so often talks about our relationship with God as a marriage that we as part of the church are the bride and he is the bridegroom. Right. If I as a husband said, well... Do I love my wife? Well, of course I do. I pay the bills. I make sure that she gets the best quote on her car insurance. I fix the things that maybe need broken if I can, you know, reach them. Ruth could say, well, you know, I show my love by the fact that he is a well-fed young man. And she will get up with the kids more often than not during the night. She hears them before I do. And certainly, love motivates us to do those things and to do those things gladly. We, we don't hesitate to do it for them because we, we love them. And not reluctantly, usually. But none of those things I mentioned 
create intimacy in a marriage. They don't create closeness in a marriage or togetherness. If all our marriage was is a list of delegated jobs, there's the blue jobs, there's the pink jobs, go forth and do, there is not a closeness. Things would be cold and clerical and clinical, right? There are other things that need a marriage to, to go well, like giving your spouse time, undivided time, undistracted time, time or affection romance doesn't matter how long you've been married there is always room for romance or what about words taking time to talk to your wife but more than just having good communication actually talking to them and telling them that you love them no it's not like the guy who says well you know i told you i love you on your wedding day if things change i'll let you know no but actually constantly regularly telling them that you care recognizing qualities that are there and apparent and you name those qualities and say i see that in you and i love that about you and i notice that when other people maybe don't and you praise them you build them up it's closeness, intimacy. Uh, the Avatar movies, there's a new one out and I really enjoy the movies. But one of the things that the characters say to each other is, I see you. And in the movies, it is a very powerful sentence. It's more than just hello. But even in real life, how many marriages have you heard of whenever someone might say, I feel invisible in my own home. I feel like nobody sees me. The job of your spouse is always to say, well, I see you. I see you. And that's what creates that closeness and that intimacy. So hear me, church, whenever I say at the start of this series that there is a difference between doing things out of love and there's then doing things that will create intimacy and closeness with God. Okay? Just because you're busy doesn't mean that we assume that we're close with God. The point in this series is not to call you to be more busy this year in church, but into closeness with God. And so many verses that we can turn to. James 4 says, if we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. Philippians 3, Paul says, I count all the things that I've done as loss for the surpassing worth of what? Serving him? No. Preaching for him? No. Telling others about him? No. Of knowing him. It's relationship, it's closeness. Oh, for a closer walk with God. But the invitation is here for you to draw near, to know him. Christian, do you live with that sense of surpassing worth? I know him and I am known by him. I'm not invisible to him. Christian, do not settle. Do not settle for simply being busy for him. Servants of the king will always still do work, but children of the king, children of God, have a relationship with him. It's a very different way of doing things. Remember whenever God told Samuel to go and anoint the new king, they went to Jesse's house? What did he tell the prophet in 1 Samuel 16? You're so busy looking at the outward appearance. I'm looking at their heart. I don't care about what they do. I want to know what's going on inside. Likewise, Isaiah 29, and I could spend a whole sermon on this chapter alone, but let me just cherry pick verse 13. It says, because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips while their hearts are far from me. They're doing all the right things. They're ticking all the boxes, but I'm the God who's looking at their heart and I see. It's all action, but there's no closeness. Please, drill into this. Going into the new year, I could easily bombard you with more things that we want to do, more things that we want to see happen, and how we need people to step up going into the new year. But before we even get to that, please, Understand me that God is more interested in your heart 
than what you are doing with your hands. Because once the heart is right, all those other things will start flowing into place. Because where your heart is, there your treasure is also. Amen? What's the greatest commandment Jesus gave? Love the Lord your God with all your heart. <coughs> Christian, are you on fire for God? Are you fully in love with him? Does he have all of your heart this morning? I'm asking because we saw it over COVID whenever there was people and they don't have the things to do. They can't serve in campaigners or they can't lead worship or they can't do Bible class. And all of a sudden, all they're left with is... turns out not only in this church but in many many other churches there were a lot of people who were busy for God but weren't very close with God and this is the heart of the new series to start the new year with a focus on cultivating a closer walk with God a more passionate walk with God, not being busier, but being more satisfied in him. In 1 Timothy 1, Paul is writing about a warning to false teachers. Okay, that, That's the context of the verse. But listen to what verses 5 and 6 says. It says, the purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience and genuine faith. But some people have missed this whole point. They have turned away from these things and spent their time in meaningless discussions. I wonder, Christian, does your faith feel like it is just meaningless talk sometimes we're saying the right things we're ticking the right boxes but ultimately it feels like we're going around and round in circles and doesn't your heart not cry out oh for a closer walk i want something real i want something tangible and so over the next few weeks, we will be looking at how we can make that shift in our daily lives. Little things that can ultimately make a big difference and keep us close with God. Lean into the small, boring things. Yes, they, sometimes it feels boring, sometimes it feels mundane. But lean into those little things in the pursuit of Christ and watch things change. And guess what? It's not... I'm telling you now, it won't happen overnight, okay? Don't think, one sermon, it's all going to be done. Or I'm going to fix this in a week. This time next week, I'm going to be the closest person of God that's ever lived. No. Much like all the people who are going to start going to the gym this week. <laughs> if they look in the mirror at the end of the day and say, well, I don't see any difference. This, it doesn't work. I'm not going to back anymore. They'll never change. But the people who keep going, and they have the discipline of sticking with it. Maybe a month, maybe six months, maybe it'll take a year, but they'll be able to look back and say, I don't quite know when it happened, but at some point over the course of that year, over those six months, I lost the weight. I feel fitter, I feel fresher, I feel it. Or maybe it's a couple and they start dating, and it's maybe a couple of months or it's a year or a couple of years. They don't quite know when it happened, there wasn't like this instantaneous thing, but they can look back and say, at some point over this journey, I fell in love with you. At some point, there was this bond that has convinced me that I want to marry you. You're the one for me. Likewise, at some point, you're not going to be able to look back and say, there was the moment I got close with God. There was the thing that happened, but rather you'll be able to look back over the period of time, not at the shining lights, not because you cried every time you opened your Bible, the, sort of the skies opened up and the light came down. Oh, oh, oh. All right, that, that doesn't happen every time. But you stick with it. And all of a sudden you realize, I feel closer to him than I ever did. Okay? Now the first thing that we're going to look at is perhaps the most neglected thing in our church and it's probably going to hit with a touch of irony because we're so close to, to Christmas 
But I want to talk about fasting, not only because we've got our day of fasting on Wednesday, which is, but this is a huge topic, okay? So consider this an overview, okay? Not an in-depth study of fasting. There's so many verses, so many things that we could say. I, I, I struggled to try and um, keep it concise. Now, it's going to feel ironic this week because we have probably spent literally the last seven days, maybe the last month of December, eating whatever we wanted, when we wanted, showing little or no restraint whatsoever. Trifle at 10 a.m.? Sure, why not? The cream will probably not keep much longer. Celebrations? Why not? We've got the wee piles of the wrapping paper all around us. Another roast dinner? Absolutely, of course. I had three already this week. Let's have another one. That's what happens at Christmas, right? That's what happens. We don't show anything. So before we get into talk about what fasting is, let's be very clear about what it's not because this is the confusion that happens at this time of year. Fasting is not a diet. It's not a diet, okay? Uh, yes, there are dieting gurus out there that will suggest intermittent fasting is a good way of losing weight. Fair play. Or maybe they'll try the 5-2 diet or the Daniel diet or whatever it happens to be, whatever name they give it. I am not interested in talking about a health kick this morning, okay? I'm not interested in that. that that's not what we're trying to do here. This is a spiritual rejuvenation that we're going for. Joel 2 says, rend your hearts, not your garments. That is to say, this isn't a physical test of endurance. This isn't about who can last the longest without eating. They must be more spiritual than anyone else. No, if all you do is skip a meal or two and your heart doesn't engage God, all you've done is make yourself hungry. There's no merit to that. No merit to it whatsoever, spiritually speaking. God is interested in the heart. That's what he's after. And so what fasting is, is a cry from the soul that says, Lord, I am hungry, but I am more hungry for you. I am thirsty for the seed work. I need my daily bread, but God, I need you more than my daily bread. I'm longing for you to come and move and draw near, and I can't go any further, God, until I know that you're with me, until you work in my heart, until I know and feel your presence. I can't go any further, God, and I'm not. And I need you. My heart aches for you. That's what fasting is. Psalm 42, we've sang it this morning. As the deer pants for streams of water, so I long for you. Oh God, I thirst for God, the living God. When can I go? When can I get to God? Because I'm hungry, I need to get there. Oh, for a closer walk. That's the declaration fasting makes because it's done privately, away from what other people can see. All right, Matthew 6 tells us specifically, don't make a big song and dance about it. Try your best to keep it under lock and key. Don't let other people know. I mean, that's why we, we don't bother with it, so many of us. Because there's no human reward for it. There's no uh, praise. There's no um, reputation or status because we don't tell anyone. It's for God ears alone to say father this is just for your ears i don't need others to know i don't want others to know just you i want you because you alone can satisfy the deepest longings of my heart and i don't care about anyone else i don't need them to know this is me and you this is me and you maybe that's why we struggle so much There's an interesting thought from Matthew 9, and this is where we're going to sort of set up camp. The disciples of John came to him, Jesus saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth in an old garment for the patch tears away from the garment and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins and so both are preserved. The idea of a fast is to abstain from food for a set period of time. For spiritual reasons. 
And in this passage, John the Baptist's followers are, are fasting. Even the Pharisees are fasting. Okay, traditionally they only fast. They only had two bites of straw fast once a year. Okay, in Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the Pharisees fasted twice a week on Mondays and Thursdays because they were more spiritual than everyone else. Maybe that's why they were so grumpy all the time. But they see Jesus' disciples and they're pegging out. Okay, and they did this quite a lot. And it got Jesus' disciples a bit of a bad reputation because they were seen as ir ir irreverent, worldly. Remember, they were picking the ears of corn on the Sabbath and eating it, and it's like, this was scandalous and horrible. You know, it's like, you're not supposed to do that. So people had questions. Why are your guys not fasting? Why are they not as spiritual as everyone else whenever you're claiming to be the Son of God? And this was Jesus' reply to them. And Jesus makes some huge claims. Remember the idea of the of God and his people or it's like the bride and the groom. Uh, and, and that was the common metaphor. And so Jesus claims to be God. He says, no, it's a wedding party. The groom has come. I'm here now. You don't fast when it's a time of the feast. There will be a time to fast. Notice he says when you will fast, not maybe when some of you fast or maybe you think about fasting. There's an expectation underlying that you will fast, church, that you will do it at some point. But, but while we're here, about being my bond, okay, let me just say about this. The new wine thing, okay, and the new wine scam thing. Let me clarify. Some people use this as a bully text, okay? Be very wary of this when people start talking about new wine to you. Um, because they use it to force change, you know. And so they say, like, let's get rid of the organ. Or, let's get rid of the, the King James Bible. Let's get rid of the old choir. Why? Why? Why should we do it? I got new wine. I got a new thing, and you got old wine skins, and so we've got to get rid of this new thing. And so make way for it. And it's so ridiculous to me to think that Jesus. They think Jesus was talking about getting rid of a choir, the, you know, a Bible translation. Uh, when he was talking about this, it's like, no, he really wasn't talking about those things. He wasn't talking about anything as trivial as that, but something way more important. It's, it's about a new wineskin, a new way of doing things. The groom has come. Christ has come. There's a new dynamic because when you're at a wedding, what are you doing? You're celebrating a new relationship. There's a new dynamic now between the bride and the groom, and we celebrate, and we feast, and things have changed. That's what Jesus said. Things have changed now. So we feast. In the Old Testament, you fasted whenever you had to consecrate the people. Remember when Joshua was going into the Promised Land? The command was to, 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 uh, to fast and to consecrate themselves before the Lord, before they went into the new Promised Land. Or, or there was a time of sorrow or grief or heaviness. Esther, before she went to go see her husband, fasted for days for such a time as this. Or it was to mark sorrow and repentance. Remember Nineveh, Jonah went in and there was revival and the people tore their, their clothes and put on sackcloth and ash and they fasted because such was their sorrow against God. But Jesus said, no, but I'm here now. We don't fast like that anymore because those reasons are redundant now because fasting doesn't make you consecrate before the Father now. That your relationship with the groom makes you consecrate before the God. <laughs> Hebrews tells us that Christ suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Okay, so, so the dynamic has changed. It's a time to feast, not fast. A new dimension with our relationship with God. Praise God for that. So, so why do we fast now? Well, notice that Jesus said in that verse that's highlighted that there will come a time when the bridegroom is taken away from them and the time for fasting will return. There's an angst. There should be an angst in the heart of every believer when we're caught between what is and what has been and, and what will come. We're hungry. We know that there's eternity waiting. We know that there's heaven waiting. We know that there's a home with our Father in heaven waiting for us. And we're hungry for that. And we're ready for it. And we want it to happen. And we're putting our stomach where our heart is. And we fast and we say, God, the things of this earth do not satisfy me anymore. I want you. Because we tasted it. And we want it again. That's what the heart of the church is when it fasts. My soul pants for you because you satisfy in a way that nothing else can. There's a better way. Come again, Lord Jesus. 
That's the idea. Hear me out. Time for confession, okay? There used to be a time whenever I would only eat a steak if it was well done, okay? Forgive me. I didn't know any better. What happened was I was out at a fancy steak place uh, with, with some friends, some guys, and uh, the sign on the door said, please do not uh, offend our chef by asking him to cook it well done. And I was like, okay, what's going on? And some of these guys, they were asking for their steak so rare. I mean, it came out like cold and blue. And I was like, that thing will move if he cuts into that. You know, it's like a, a, a good vet might still be able to save it. Uh, and it was so, it's like, Ugh. And look, so I, I started to see, right, well, okay, let's see what, what's going on now. The best I can do now is medium rare, okay? That's about as far as I can go right now, but I'm on a journey of sanctification and I'm getting there. I see a steak well done now and I think, you should have just ordered a pork chop because it's ruined, you just wrecked it. Why? Because I know there's a better way. I've tasted it. I've tasted it. Let me change the metaphor, okay? I remember taking our girls to the beach whenever they were Hudson's age, okay? Just barely walking. And uh, we brought a paddling pool to the beach, okay? And I filled it up and with the water. And they were happy to play around, and that was so much safer for them. Uh, and it was easy, we could sit and enjoy the sun and they could play away happily enough. Then came the day whenever they looked up <laughs> and they saw the ocean <laughs> and they saw everyone playing in the ocean and the games and the waves and I was like, right, well, the paddle and pool was made redundant. I said, Dad, we're not playing in this anymore. <laughs> There's a better way. There's a better way to experience the beach. I want to, I want to plunge the depths of the ocean. Fasting is the equivalent of saying to your Heavenly Father, I know there's an ocean that I can play in. There's depths that I haven't experienced yet. So I'm not satisfied staying here in the shallow end of my Christianity. And I, being in the paddling pool is not going to cut it anymore. Being in the shallow end of, of this world isn't going to cut it anymore. I want more God over a closer walk with you. Let me just give you two elements here, okay? Fasting, there's power in it, okay? Um, in Mark 9, we, we have the transfiguration. Jesus comes back down the hill and the, they all rejoin with the bigger group of disciples. And they realize that they've been struggling to cast out a demon-possessed child. And they can't seem to do it and they're really struggling. They've done it before. Remember when Jesus sent out the 72? They came back and were like, yeah, we're casting out demons and healing the sick. And I was like, well, that's amazing, right? They've done it before. And they were struggling and I was like, well, why can't we do it? So they turned to Jesus and says, well, if you can do it. And Jesus is like, if, come on, right? And he casts out the demon. The boy's left his dead. He raises the child and everyone was like, wow, that's amazing. We drop in the verse 28. When Jesus then entered the house, after this had all happened, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer and fasting. Now some translations don't include the word fasting. If you go to your King James, it will tell you fasting. Because it's included in the text. Now if you want to head on right at the start of the new year, there are kinds of demons, okay? Now there's a story, okay? There are different kinds of demons. This one only responds to prayer and fasting. Right? That, you never got taught that in Sunday school, right? But fasting, you see, brings you closer to God. But it can also unleash a spiritual power that we can't quite grasp. Remember that, that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and authorities and against cosmic powers of present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil. In the heavenly places, therefore, we take up the whole armor of God. And a spiritual battle demands spiritual weapons. If you just try to cover up your lust or your anger or your jealousy, people may not see it, but we know that they're still there. But we think that if we can control our tongue, it'll just disappear. But there will be times whenever it just bursts out, okay? You're in the car and you've got your I Love Jesus t-shirt on. You're singing your Christian songs. Yeah, hallelujah, right? Uh, and then all of a sudden somebody cuts in in front of you and you're shouting at them and you're 
right off their back end, going, gonna be, gonna get done with. So it's like, and you suddenly realise it's going, oh, that does, this doesn't fit, <laughs> this doesn't fit. And you back off, and then there's shame, and then there's guilt, and so you back away and say, I can't really pray after what I've done. I'm feeling a wee bit low, I'm feeling a wee bit bad, and, and, and that happens. But instead of trying to hide our flaws, what if we prayed and fasted over them instead? And we pour out our lives, longing for God to draw near. Remember, if we draw near to Him, He will draw near to us, not pull away from us. There will come a time in your prayer life, okay? Every time you pray, there will come a time when you have a choice. Do you lean in and confess and surrender your sin to God? Or do you choose to kind of skirt around it? And I'm like, you know, it's like, Lord, I'm sorry for the, the you know, I mean, God bless the missionaries, amen. Lean in and talk about your sin. And I know in my life there have been times where I have just broken down in tears and I surrender it to a God who has promised to be on you. <coughs> and it's not easy. It doesn't get easier. If anything, sometimes it gets harder because it's like, God, I have to do this again about the same sin, about the same thing. All right, sometimes it gets harder. But there's a choice to be made. And here's the thing. I still have those things of jealousy in me. I still have those things of aggression in me. God has not taken them away. I don't think he will take them away. I think it's part of my design. I think it's part of who he made me to be. He wired me this way. But the enemy has corrupted them and is using them against me into sin. But what God wants to do is to say, okay, but I want to take that and I want you to be jealous for me. I want you to be jealous for the church. I want you to be jealous for your family. I want you to be fiercely protective of them and not allow anyone that would threaten them to come in near them. And I want you to use that jealousy for my glory. I want you to use that aggression to stand up for, for people who have been hurt and broken and fight for them and to speak up for them and to be determined to do something with them. I want to fight not other people that drive past me in the car, but I want to fight the devil. I'm ready for him. I want to fight him and say, no, I'm angry at the things and the hurt that you've caused. It breaks my heart at what you're doing to these people. I want to fight you. I know you're defeated already, but I can't wait to get a few punches on myself. And I want to fight. And just tell me, I know you're defeated already. Because there's victory in Jesus. But we use those things. See, what God will do in times of prayer and fasting is to use those things for his glory. There is power in fasting, even to cast out demons. But I can only speak from my experiences in this. The things that I thought were problems that needed to be hidden away or taken away from me altogether, God has sanctified and surrendered and used them in a closer walk with him. He redirects them and uses them for his glory and his power and his honour. There's power in fasting. Because it takes you to the place where you have to make a choice. But not only that, but there is revelation in fasting. It's like an MRI scan. It can help us really diagnose what's going on. It is a way of getting at the heart of issues when you're alone with God. And you know that God knows everything. So those excuses of, well, I was too tired or I wasn't feeling great, and goes, yeah, we're still okay to do this, and you're still fine to do this, and we're still... God has a way of calling through our nonsense sometimes, doesn't he? Here's what fasting has taught me. I eat my feelings. I'm shocking, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, I hate waste and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> And eat the scraps off the kids' places. I was not going to let a whole roast potato go to waste. I mean, come on, what am I? You know, an animal? It turns out maybe I am. But what fasting has done is it has exposed that there's a script running in my head where I can go wildly between pride and utter defeat where I think that I'm doing good and I, I might get cocky and I think, yeah. And then all of a sudden, who do you think you are? 
your church is small compared to what other people are doing. That's your fault. You're the pastor. You're failing because of this reason. They left because of this reason. They didn't come back because of this reason. But do you know what stops me thinking like that? Chocolate cake. A big greasy burger doesn't judge me. And I go, nom, 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 nom. All of a sudden, I'm not thinking about those things anymore. And there's comfort in food. By the way, we should praise God for our food, all right? He didn't have to make it as tasty as what he did, but he did, all right? Our God is so wonderful and so beautiful and so such a great creator that our palates are rich and full. Praise God for that, all right? But fasting stops me from seeking comfort in the wrong places. Right? Whenever I would turn to food, fasting says, but I'm not, I can't turn to that. I refuse to turn to that. I am turning to the comforter the creator and the sustainer of my life. And that shame that I feel, it doesn't come from him, it comes from the enemy. All right, God never works in your life in such a way to pull you down, but rather he puts his finger on sin. He puts his finger on areas of weakness that he might draw you close to him, that you might turn towards him and run to him, that he might heal you and help you. Remember, sin and shame, they are barriers to God. If we regard iniquity in our hearts, the Lord will not hear us. And so he puts his finger on it. And by fasting, it drives away the false comforters to steer me to the true comforter. Why? Because we turn away from the lesser things to declare our dependence on the supreme thing, the ultimate thing, that we might plunge the depths of God. God, you are my God. Psalm 121. I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. My help isn't going to come from my coffee in the morning or my glass of wine in the evening. He is the one who will not let my foot be moved. He is the one who will keep me. He is the one who will not slumber or sleep. It is him. It is he. The one who is above it all. So why do we keep turning to these other things? And I find if I go without food for 24 hours, whether it's supper to supper, breakfast to breakfast, it exposes things. My snappiness. They'll show me just how long my patience really is. Or how quick to anger I really am. Is a good discipline. Not only as a positive expression of longing for prayer, but exposes the negatives, it diagnoses my heart. Because it takes away all those false comforts. So God, I'm not trying to find comfort in the gym. I'm not trying to find my comfort and distractions in a pizza box or a tin of chocolates. I am longing for you. I am aching for you. And I want you to keep drawing me close by exposing that sin. Because fasting will remove those things. Put his finger on it. God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. I've tasted it. I've tasted it. That angst of what has been and what will eventually come. And we're caught in the middle and we're hungry for more. And look, understand, this is for everyone, okay? This is not for the spiritual elite. This isn't something that is reserved for elders or deacons, okay? And for people who've been saved a long time. It's for anyone. Please, write this down. God does not have favorites. But he does have intimates. Are you close with God? Church, as we start 2023... Will you press into that deeper relationship with Christ? We have that day of prayer and fasting on Wednesday. 
this is the call. Make it a priority. Build your week around it. It flies in the face of our culture that says the way to abundance is freedom. Love who you want, marry who you want, identify however you want, do whatever it is that you need to do to make yourself feel happy. Fasting says no, no. The way through to abundance is through abstinence. I'm going to put boundaries around things. I'm going to put boundaries around food, around sex, around my marriage. I'm going to do that. Not to cheapen them, but to elevate them. To show that they're truly of worth, but to also drive me to you. And on Wednesday, if you can, and I know not everyone medically is able to just stop eating for whatever reason. If that's the case, turn off your phone for the day. Turn off the TV for a day. Turn it all, uh, do something that will cost. Do something that will hurt. Take away that thing that gives you comfort. To make sure that you're saying, God, I want you more. Can I suggest the two, two meals on Wednesday? Like skip breakfast, skip lunch, and then eat with your family at dinner time, okay? There's no, no need for martyrdom here, okay? There's no need for saying, I'm not gonna eat all week, yeah. All right, I don't wanna have to do a funeral at the end of the week, okay? But two meals, set aside, and instead of your coffee breaks and your lunch breaks, you just step aside and say, Lord, I'm hungry, but I hunger for you more. I thirst for you more to see it my husband, to see it my wife, to see it my children, to see it my neighbours. God, I am thirsty, but I am more thirsty and hungry for that closer walk with you. And listen to me, you can do it. You can do it. It's not supposed to be easy, but you can do it. And through, and though it's not in front of other people, it's between you and God. I said, I mean, that's why we don't do it the way we should, but. Make it a priority for one day. Set the tone for the rest of the year. Not to curry favour with God, all right? This isn't a case of, you know, you rub your Bible and you get three wishes. But rather, this is an invitation to draw near and spend time with the one who we are in relationship with. Let's pray. Father, we... Thank you for this invitation that we have to get away from the busyness and to draw near to you. Father, I pray that we would know the reality of this in our lives, not just on Wednesday, but all week, all month, all year, Lord, that our hearts would be caught in this perpetual uh, dichotomy of being satisfied in Christ. Our sins are forgiven but also we are not satisfied yet because we know there is more to come. And we pray, Lord, that we would draw close to you, that our faith is more than simply ticking boxes and being busy, but we would be a people in relationship with you, that we would not forget our first love. And we pray this in your